حركاتهم وهمومهم وعزومهم لله لا للخلق والشيطان نعم الرفيق لطالب السبل التي تفضي إلى الخيرات والإحسان تفضي إلى الخيرات والإحسان الحمد لله رب العالمين الله عز وجل has blessed us all with Al-Islam. May Allah Azza wa Jal enable all of us to die upon the state of Al-Islam. Now, my dear respected brothers and sisters and all those listening, it's been well overdue to continue the that which we started, the different, I would say, series or videos of reminiscing the scholars. Now, I do see that it's very important and one of the brothers, may Allah reward him, did reach out to us in order for us to continue them so as promised this is the continuation and inshallah we're going to touch on the various scholars that allah the almighty jalla jalalu blessed us and enabled us that yani, alhamdulillah gave us the opportunity and enabled all and enabled me to be able to sit and many other brothers with the scholars of the sunnah those that teach one to cling on to the sunnah to the quran and sunnah and in order for me to carry on and fulfill this properly, I think it's only best I continue the benefits and the stories of Shaykhana Al-Allama, Shaykh Rabi' bin Hadi Al-Madkhali, Hafidhahullahu Ta'ala wa Ra'a. May Allah Azza wa Jal preserve him and protect him from all evil and all of the Mashaykh and all of the Muslims. Protect us all and save us all from evil. And enable us to die firm upon the Sunnah and the Quran to die upon the Quran and Sunnah, to die upon Al-Islam in a good state and to give us all Husn al-Khatima. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us from those that die upon the Sunnah without innovating into his religion. May Allah Azza wa Jal enable us all to be from those that practice the teachings of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when you hear the name of Muhammad, then Sallu Alayhi. Send blessings and salutations unto him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So without further ado, we mentioned and we highlighted, of course, the arrival of the Sheikh in Medina at the time in that year. And it was rumors at first. So with regards to the stage that we were at with the Sheikh, obviously we mentioned that there were brothers that were close to the Sheikh that did not want us, unfortunately, to get close to the Sheikh. Lakin alhamdulillah, wallahu khayrul makirin. Allah is the best of planners. And everything I believe, subhanAllah, always happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. So at this moment of time, we started reading Al-Usul Al-Thalatha, me and my respected brother, my dear brother Mujahid, from the Maldives, may Allah preserve him. And he didn't wish to join me on these episodes. It was only right, but he excused himself. And I respect that from him. And um, so it was me and him in the car. And... We were, so we started Usul al-Thalatha and that would be after uh, the prayer of Salat al-Asr. So usually there will be uh, uh, another brother who would read onto the Shaykh Manhaj al-Haq, the Manzuma, okay, Manhaj al-Haq. So I, as it would come, obviously now I'm more acquainted with the Shaykh, the Shaykh knows me now, I've introduced myself, I've told him where, I've, where I'm from and you know he knows of me so to the level where he can trust. But of course, it's only only beginning stages. And with the Sheikh, he's had many people. Just to mention something as well, the setup in Mecca, Mecca al-Mukarramah, is or was very different with regards to the Sheikh and him being with the students to when he arrived in Medina. Because of course, we know the Sheikh was in Medina in the beginning initially. Then he went to Mecca, then he came back to Medina. So when the Sheikh was in Mecca and he moved there, I recall myself the time I mentioned the first uh, video that it was very easy for, for people to go inside to you know sit in the Sheikh's library. There was no need to kind of phone a specific person, or it was very easy. And I preferred that way, to be honest, you know, to be quite frank, because people were able to come and just benefit, sit with the Sheikh, maybe in his library or maybe upstairs where the other Sheikh would come if he would have guests. It was in and out. People would read books onto him. Many people, so they had benefited from the Sheikh 
you know, in several ways. But now when he came to Medina, things, it was as if things were planned out to be a certain way. So hence why, you know, there were brothers that were around him, you know, making sure he goes in and out of the, of the house. So even initially, when we started reading the book, we were very hesitant. So I, I did inform the brother, you know what, let's use the opportunity. We come, you know, it's been many times when the brother didn't come who initially reads. And I believe it's going to be only right for us to, you know, ask the sheikh. Let's ask directly the sheikh. So obviously you mentioned we asked, the sheikh gave us permission. And obviously at the time, we eventually, after the, maybe the third or fourth sitting, we eventually told the brothers and, um, you know, those that were older than us in age and were more uh, closer, or I say much closer to the sheikh and had known him for, you know, many years, but several, uh, to us uh, meeting the sheikh in Medina and getting closer to him. So we just informed them just so that they know, of course, what's going on. So at this moment of time, the sheikh would start to, after some time went on, he started just praying locally. So he would move from the masjid that was local to me. And then he would go to the masjid Fatima behind which is on the opposite side, in front of the mabna or the building of the students in Rabwa, and then he would go to, and then he would also go to the masjid with the students. So the sheikh he loved for al ilm, he loved you know those that sought knowledge and those that wanted to seek knowledge. He just loved them, and you can tell from the sheikh, even though he was old in age, he still wanted to be around them. You know, maybe give them time if he had, and the normal salawat he would go. Now there came a time when the sheikh he. I heard that he was going to start going to, or I, I, it news reached me that he started going to the Haram. So I was never involved in that program of going to the Sheikh to the Haram initially in the beginning. So he would go with two other brothers. First, it was one other brother, and it started two other brothers. Or sometimes it would be a the Sheikh's uh, either his son-in-law or his son, and then two other brothers. It alternated. It, you know, it differed from time to time, and they of course would read or whatever. I was not aware of what they would do in the car, of course, but I'm pretty sure they would benefit from the Sheikh, mashallah. And then obviously, after some time, the Sheikh, he um, would come for Dhuhr Salah. I would also attend Dhuhr Salah, but at times as well, if I got caught up in the jamia, I wasn't able to attend. So there was a very nice brother, mashallah, from the, from the, from the Emirates who would also read on him. And then he, when he got busy, there was another brother that took over, started reading on him as well. And people were just benefiting. It was nice in the beginning. It was nice and sweet because it wasn't known to everyone the timetable of the sheikh. If that's you know to be to be quite fair, not unless you came to Rabba to visit. So things were just going around. So even at the time when we were reading on to the sheikh, I remember the sheikh Subhanallah the benefits he would give. He would always give benefits, of course, but there were just certain things I would just you know the sheikh would just listen and he would just want you know to hear usul thalatha. You know that was sheikh and we had the the one of sheikh Thameen. So we just read the matin and he would like to hear it and he would, you know, he'd give us you know, annotations, benefits left, right and centre. And then there came a time when the Sheikh said, uh, inshuruha, inshuruha, you know, you know, spread it, spread, spread these, you know, the, the, these lessons to others, you know, make them listen. And he would be like, this is from the words of Tawheed. And then the Sheikh would be like, you know, kul, kul, and I remember specifically the Sheikh quoting and saying that يعني, يجب على كل مسلم يحفظ uh, and he would, you know, the Shaykh, mashallah, tabarak rahman he would be like, it's, upon, it's incumbent upon everyone to memorize, to know what's within this, you know, uh, explanation, this book and this text, to memorize, understand it and implement it. And then, you know, for us, we didn't understand. Then he said again the next lesson. So we thought, you know, he wanted us to, you know, speak spread the, the, you know, that which we were doing. Obviously, we didn't record at the time because we, there was no need for us. We just wanted to benefit. Um, although thinking of now, it would have been nice if I had heard the benefits maybe go through them again. But Alhamdulillah. And then we informed the other brother and the other brother told us that maybe, you know, is see if the Sheikh really wants it. But we never actually spread the lesson or anything. So no one knew of these lessons that we were having. And Alhamdulillah, when the other brother had time, we managed to complete with the Sheikh, from, I remember from the beginning until the end, Manhaj al Haq, the Manzuma. And that was really beneficial because I remember the Sheikh sometimes, when, whenever the Sheikh would hear a benefit or something that's just out of this world in terms of benefit, he would, he would always say, Allahu Akbar. Just like that which the Sahaba and the Prophet would do as well. So, um, you know, it was really beneficial and really nice to see that. There came a time when, you know, things were getting more busier. And as we mentioned, the lesson stopped in Sahih Muslim in his house. They put a pause on it. 
until I think time went on. The Sheikh now he had a timetable where Fajr he would come local masjid, Dhuhr he would come out sometimes, but as the years went on, the Sheikh would stop coming for Salatul Dhuhr because of the his the sun will affect him, his health, and it was too hot for him. So I remember in the beginning when he would come, he would come with an umbrella for specifically um, when those that were close to the Sheikh and what have you realized that I was a regular, they said to me, you know, how much can you give in terms of time? Now, I'll be quite honest, it, 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 I mean, for people seeing it from outside in, it looked like, wow, it's, no, but for, you know, inside out, it was a huge responsibility. And I didn't fully know what I was getting myself into, if that makes sense, because it wasn't something that I had intended. I merely wanted, and Allah knows my intention, just to benefit from the Sheikh. Hence why, like I've mentioned many times, I'll mention again, there was no need for me to spread it to anyone. You know, people that were very close to me said to me, oh, I didn't know you were, you were there because it's like, you know, that's something that was personal for me. So I'm only sharing it because, inshallah, I ask Allah the Almighty to make, I ask Allah the Almighty to make it a benefit, to make it sincere. And those that listen, لعلهم, you know, it will be to get a different insight from someone that's actually uh, seen the Shaykh up close. So... I said to them, inshallah, we'll try and see. So there was another uh, another Asian brother who also started coming and he, he was introduced to the Shaykh and he, mashallah, was very prompt. So it started to be for Salatul Fajr. I remember it was other brothers, but then when one of the brothers from the Emirates had to travel, um, it was only me and him left. So it would mainly be the British brother, I remember. After months went by, and then they realized that, you know, I was regular and I was someone that they can trust with regards to, you know, helping the sheikh and, you know, tending to his needs. They decided to kind of take a foot back and they would only come when uh, um, when they were free. Because obviously they also had busy, uh, you know, they were also busy. They had own uh, um, uh, re uh, responsibilities to attend to. And for me, it was literally, you know, footsteps. So then... I remember the, the Shaykh he will start to come for Salatul Jum'ah. And I remember Salatul Jum'ah in the beginning he would go to uh, Masjid Al Juhani. And then from there he would come also to my local. So he, he would change. And the Shaykh, subhanAllah, I remember when he would come. I remember one specific inf uh, um, incident when. Yeah, I remember um, the Shaykh he came and then he sat. And he, of course, we came. He would come with the umbrella and water because it was, the sun was too hot. And and by then, I had kind of got familiar with most of his sons. Some had not come back to Medina. Some were living outside of Medina. And um, so I, I knew what the sheikh obviously needed, what he didn't need, and of course, the brother as well, the Asian brother that would help me. And you know, we started helping the sheikh with the umbrella and what have you. So at this moment of time, the sheikh, I remember putting him inside. And then there was another brother next to him. So I kind of went forward and the Shaykh would listen attentively. And I remember looking back, subhanAllah, one time and I could just see tears dropping down the Shaykh. And I was like, subhanAllah, because obviously, you know, the Imam uh, had said, you know, it was an admonition and it was a beautiful khutbah, beautiful, beautiful khutbah and a reminder for myself and all those that were listening and the Shaykh. So then the Shaykh, he no, when I came back after Salah, I realized the Shaykh, you know, had been crying. So that's when I was like, subhanAllah, you know, it's, you know, it shows that the sheikh has been touched. It's of course, of course, generally speaking, anyone would be. But, you know, how emotional the sheikh uh, was, many people or is, many people don't have that uh, knowledge of that side of him. They don't really know that side. They just know the sheikh to be imam, jarh wa ta'adil. And of course, we're not taking that away from him without a doubt. Allah has blessed him with regards to, you know, that specific thing at the time, you know, earlier on before many of us were alive. And he was known for that, but the Sheikh has a very soft part uh, with him, I should say, soft character with him, you know. So, um, which reminded me of, of, generally speaking, when you read into, you know, characteristics and biographies of people, that they're very harsh with regards to certain things, but people didn't know. So, anyway, going back to Jum'ah, um, afterwards, subhanAllah, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I must have asked the Sheikh, and, you know, he said to me, did you not hear? And I was like, subhanAllah. Yeah, and yeah, I couldn't say anything, you know. So then there were times or moments where I would just let the sheikh be and I wouldn't really, you know, intervene with regards to or even pose a question or anything. So 
I remember one thing that, 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 I, that I did realize because after some time people started coming like Fajr, there'll be other people that wanted to come and people would just like to come and ask questions, get close to the Sheikh. And I always realized, and I remember one, me and the brother Mujahid would say that the Sheikh's got a haber. He's got a very strong character and, you know, way he carries himself, the way he comes out of the car, the way he is. I remember up until today, I would say it straight, subhanAllah, I was very, like, I would say afraid of the Sheikh of the Ghost, you know, coming close to him and saying something because the Sheikh, he would analyze you. And I remember he would do the specific look when, let's say you're on his right hand side, he would do the specific look and just see, you know, he would listen. And one thing I realize is that, you know, the Sheikh can handle himself even at that old age. <laughs> Allah barik, may Allah preserve him. But one thing I remember was like sometimes a brother would come and, and he would ask the question, the Sheikh would look at him and then he would carry on walking. Let's say he's holding my hand or the other brother's hand. And as the Sheikh's walking, the brother's repeating the question again. And then as he's going to repeat it the third time, the Sheikh would be like, I heard you. And then he'll keep quiet. And then... He would walk to the car and then maybe he'll give him an answer or give him one, one line, one phrase because it's like the Sheikh had dealt with so many people. So obviously over the time of, with his experience, he knows who's a fitna maker, who's a troublemaker. He knows who's, you know, someone has actually come for khair. He, so he was able to read through the people, you know, he had that farasa with him. That's without a doubt, you know, everyone knows that was close or knew the Sheikh. They knew that the Sheikh had this farasa with him. So, and there'll be times when he would take so long, even at points, I would, you know, the brother would kind of, so a brother, let's say, would ask a question twice. The Sheikh hasn't answered, and he would look at me, he'll be like, I'm going to, uh, to read the sual, Sheikh. You know, he'll be like, can you, maybe if you can repeat the question to the Sheikh, thinking the Sheikh hadn't heard. So then I'll, you know, I'll always wait, me, I'll always give it time because I don't want to be put in a position where I'm repeating a question that I'm pretty sure the Sheikh already heard. But he's obviously processing it and seeing the best way he can answer that question according to that person. Because, you know, as there's etiquettes with regards to answering a question, especially to the scholars, there's etiquettes. And obviously scholars themselves, they all, there's also etiquettes with regards to replying and answering a question. So some people would give, would give a general uh, a question and they would want a specific answer. And the Sheikh, he was known, and that's one thing, but I don't want to jump, you know, um, jump the what I was saying, but generally speaking, the Sheikh, he knew, he started becoming, you know, it started becoming obvious to me that the Sheikh knows how to really handle this questioner or this question and how to, you know, bring it back to the person in the best manner that is going to, you know, either silence this troublemaker or, you know, bring about softness to this person that wants khair. So coming back to the timetable, in the beginning, I would just do Dhuhr and Asr. Up until now, it was still Dhuhr and Asr. And I think a year went by roughly. It would just be Dhuhr and Asr. But I remember though, um, uh, times came in when I remember it was very difficult for um, for my wife, Allah Hafidh her, and my family generally, because obviously it meant that there was a lot of times. This is just the beginning. The beginning, it was a bit easy because it was just Dhuhr and Asr where, you know, I'm back from Maghrib or going back to the Haram and stuff like that. Now, bearing in mind, this was a time when the Sheikh, he, you know, he had other people around them, like I mentioned. So it was like a good, let's say six to eight of us, okay, that would be regulars that would come at different salawat. So we can always alternate and we always had each other's contact number and you know it was just whoever's there let's say sometimes i remember i would get there for salat al-asr but asr and dhuhr generally speaking it was it was appointed you know and then there'll be times i'll get there and i'll find someone else there so then i'll step back who's you know maybe he's older than me preceded me and you know is already kind of there so then i'll kind of step back then i remember um yeah time went on and it was still like only those that are local in Rabwa would know that we come with the Sheikh and what have you. Then time went on and then I recall a moment came when I was asked by the brother that was very close to the Sheikh, the local, he asked me to, you know, in terms of whether I can do, you know, the Fajr and the Haram one. So that's when it got a bit, okay, I really need to think about this because obviously, you know, this is, and I remember I did, um, uh, um, Consult my friend, uh, the brother Mujahid, we spoke, you know, with regards to, you know, because he said he couldn't commit because it was going to be very, very difficult and strenuous. And generally speaking, it was. And, you know, thinking, thinking back now, I don't regret it. I actually don't regret it. 
I'll be honest, because of the benefits, alhamdulillah, that Allah favoured upon me that I was able to pick up from the Shaykh, but it was difficult. It was very difficult. And now thinking about it, I wish there was more times I you know, offered for the Shaykh. But anyway, so we started with the Fajr one before the Haram one. So the Fajr one, it was mainly the brother, um, the Asian brother would come. And when the British brother, when he got busy, you know, he, had, he was busy with his masters and what have you and other things. And generally speaking, obviously, they took their foot back because they knew that obviously, you know, they can trust us. So, you know, we started doing the Fajr. And that one specifically was, yeah, that, that, that was a deep one because it's, Fajr is a time when, you know, uh, um, not many people are going to be around, generally speaking. He's going to be going local. And, you know, you can see the Sheikh. So I remember at times, but mashallah, that brother was prompt. Despite the fact that I lived closer, many times he would come before me or whatever, and he was driving, obviously. And he was very prompt, mashallah. Um, so we, I remember we had our times when we would come, we would reach there waiting for the sheikh and you know sometimes we're, both of us are knackered. I remember times when maybe he didn't get enough rest because he's obviously working, I'm studying and you know he's just there dozing off and then the sheikh comes down and I'm like let's go akhi. And then there'll be times when I've, I, I have got my mom and say like the sheikh's there, let's go. So, we're, so obviously we're parked up in his car um, and we're just waiting sometimes, just literally just waiting until either the driver comes out or the sheikh comes out or you know driver brings him down or his sheikh's son brings him down. So um, that was something that was just amazing because it's just like, you know, we're just there. But I remember the whole essence we had to completely all the time. That's one thing I remember all the time. I had to always try to renew my intentions and just try and, you know, be dedicated because this is a responsibility at the end of the day. This is somebody's, you know, uh, well-being that we're trying to look after. He's a sheikh, alama, you know, he's someone that is, you know, of value with regards to the fact that Allah has raised them in ranks due to his knowledge. I mean, Allah raise us all in ranks and, you know, make us better than that which... We are. Point being, um, the Fajr Salah started when we started going to the Sheikh, helping him out. So usually the Sheikh would pray local in his local area. Literally, it would just be a drive, right? Turn left or turn right. Then he started attending regularly the Masjid Fatima, which was in front of the second of Tullah. That was like a regular. And one thing, this is now we're going to kind of get into it. When he would go there, the Sheikh's thing was the whole essence of you know, the Imam following the Sunnah. He loved to implement the Sunnah and he loved to remind others as well to implement the Sunnah. So from the means was that the Imam sometimes will be like, he will turn and he'll be like, Allahu Akbar. After the Mu'addin, after the Mu'addins and the Iqama, the Imam will just directly start the Salah. Now the Shaykh, of course, you know, wanting to implement the Sunnah, wanting others to do the same, he would say to the Imam, you know, you know, he said, tell them to, you know, straighten their lines and fill the gaps and to make sure that they're, you know, not crooked, that there's no gaps in between them, feet to feet, shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder, ankle to ankle. Tell them this, O Imam. You know, this is from the teachings of the, our beloved Prophet. So, of course, you know, now the ego gets in, generally speaking. So, I've seen a lot of characters that the Sheikh is informing or trying to advise. So I'm just there, <laughs> and generally speaking, um, I remember this is without, without, you know, forgetting it at all. Some of them they would accept it. Some of them they would. It would, it would be a bit difficult to kind of li listen to someone. You know, they're about to make takbir al ihram, and someone's told them that, and it's like, you know, who are you coming here telling us? And then, you know, to, for them to actually listen, take it in, and actually just do it. So it was difficult because at that moment when you you've got a position like you you know you're you're the imam. You're being told by someone else. At the beginning, some of them didn't know who the sheikh was until I remember sometimes they would come to us, me or the brother, you know, or maybe after sometimes when the sheikh's not praying, they were just walking by. We see them in the area, the imams, whatever. So they will ask us and then we'll tell him. So now obviously we know the position of the sheikh. He's either loved or he's either hated. And unfortunately, that's how, that's how it was. There was no real in between except for just maybe people that don't really know much of the sheikh. So... Um, and what happened, obviously, we got the whole, you know, clash back, as they would say, whatever, in terms of when we were seen, we'll kind of not be liked because it's like, you know, well, I know you, you, they'll associate us to be like, you know, you're, you know, with the sheikh and what have you. Not knowing, we're just, you know, we want, we're there to benefit, you know, we're not muta'asib, you know, blind followers or any, you know, we're there as, you know, students or brothers that want to help the sheikh and we love the sheikh for the sake of Islam, you know, so... Some, I remember that masjid, you know, just so that you can understand, 
he didn't stay there for too long. <laughs> you know, he didn't stay there for too long. When he, when, whenever the sheikh, and what that means is that whenever the sheikh didn't see any sort of uh, acceptance of the advice, any sort of uh, you know change and implementation of the sunnah, the sheikh he wouldn't he would move. He would tell the the, the driver, "Don't let's not go to another masjid. Let's go to another one." So then we'll go to another one. I remember we went to another one from there. I believe we did sometimes in uh, the masjid of the of the of the students one. And then the sheikh was advised, I remember, not to go there due to the fact that too many students are going to come and, you know, take the sheikh's time and energy, especially that early in the morning. Then I remember we would come to uh, the other masjid. There's another masjid behind me on my left. And that masjid is literally directly is situated on the other side of Makdiz, for those that know the area, or directly behind, you know, right opposite Makdiz, like a chocolate shop. But right behind that is the shop. Is the, is the masjid. The sheikh went there for a bit once again, didn't stay there for too long. Eventually the sheikh ended up um, staying and praying in my local, local masjid because he saw the iqbal, you know, the acceptance. He saw the, you know, uh, the love for the sunnah after advising uh, uh, the sheikh and what have you. Uh, the, the imam, you know, he saw some sort of change. And then the, and I saw it myself as well, that the imam, mashallah, he was accepting of the sheikh you know, he would even sometimes say to him, Tayyib, Tayyib, Ya Walid. You know, there, there's, there was a sense of respect. And generally speaking, obviously the sheikh's older than them, you know. All of them are the same age as his kids. You know, we're talking about a man who's in his late 80s. And I remember one time, subhanAllah, because uh, um, obviously I knew where the sheikh was. So I remember one time, the sheikh, he came down and I was there and then I saw that the light was on. So I thought to myself, wow, man, the light is very early. And I knew that the sheikh wasn't in his bedroom because obviously I knew where the sheikh's places were and stuff. And then um, he came down. I remember there was like, you know, you could tell there's some sort of tears, you know, on his eyes. One can say it's watery, but the conclusion that I came to, generally speaking, is that the sheikh obviously had been, you know, busy with regards to worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal in the night prayer. So that was something that to me was it, 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 was, it was something touching and it was like a reminder. Once again, I'm only, only mentioning this so that one can take heed, you know, someone of the late 80s is able to do such a thing with the gospel of worship and he's got all of this big responsibility where a lot of people go back to him with the gospel of certain affairs of, of the deen and yet, you know, he's worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, keep him busy. Um, obviously, you know, I'm being transparent with everything. The times when I was late, he would always say to me, لَيْشْ تَأَخَّرْتِ عَبْدَ اللَّهِ Allah يَهْدِيكْ لَيْشْ تَأَخَّرْتِ You know, he would always say to me, you know, why did you come late? May Allah guide you, why did you come late, Abdullah? And then he'll get in the car and I'll be very apologetic and I'll feel really bad. <laughs> um, you know, it was all learning stages for me really and truly because this is, you know, a big responsibility. You know, of course, the sheikh's position and what have you. But then the responsibility is only increased as time went on, generally speaking. You know, there'll be times when we'll get visitors coming from outside. I remember outside of, of, of the country, let alone outside of Medina at that specific time, because also obviously there were those that thought, you know, the sheikh is going to be the most free now. But alhamdulillah, the sheikh, he was very, very... Um, for those that came outside and he knew them very well, maybe he would give them time, speak to them before he's going to his car, up to, you know, or after he's coming, leaving the car, going back upstairs, he'll speak to them for a little bit. But all the time, this is when now the visits, visits were becoming more uh, apparent to me and, you know, I was becoming more accustomed to how the sheikh does his things, was that anyone that would come, he would tell them, you know, um, visit me after Salatul Isha. Because the sheikh didn't like, and I remember one time it was an incident, or, you know, let me not skip, but so the sheikh would tell them, let, come after Salatul Isha because then I've prayed all my salawat and everything and we can sit, you know, you know, I'll give you time. And um, then there were incidents when the, uh, um, the sheikh would be, you know, very, very busy in his adhkar, you know, extremely busy in his adhkar. I remember one time it was Salatul Fajr <laughs> and a brother came inside, or no, I think he came in his own car if I'm not mistaken, and he followed the Sheikh whatever back to the house and he was asking the Sheikh questions. From the masjid, Sheikh got back in the car, we went in the car, came out, he's still asking questions. So the Sheikh looked at him and said, you ask a lot of questions, don't you? Huh? You know, beware of asking too many questions. So the Sheikh kind of told him, often a funny but, you know, to the point way. And that's, that's how the Sheikh he was, you know, funny but to the point. So um, I remember the brother kind of like, you know, he realized 
I never saw the brother ever again asking that many questions. From that day, that day on, I'll never forget the brother. <laughs> he never asked questions like he did then the first time, obviously. Obviously, it's the whole, you know, energy and excitement, you know, to be in the presence of the Shaykh and asking him such questions because, alhamdulillah, the ulama are accessible in Medina, generally speaking, you know, in terms of obviously if you know where they, they are and where they pray locally. And this brother was local in Rabwa. Anyway, point being is that um, after some time, after some time, the lessons that we had initially in Sahih Muslim, they then got transferred and moved over to Masjid Rudwan. And now this was when the first time the Sheikh, got, the Sheikh is going to have that much of a gathering around him in an open masjid. But before we touch on that, um, the lessons that we had, which were after Salat al-Dhuhr and Asr, unfortunately, after some time, I think it was the third year, I believe, yeah, I believe it was the, th no, I think it was the second year, coming on to the second year anyway, where the, 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 the brother that was close to the Shaykh and kind of would always keep tabs, he uh, did give us a call and told everyone us reading on the Shaykh to stop. So unfortunately, we didn't even get that far on al asul al-Thalatha due to the fact, uh, the reason he gave was that, you know, it's too much for the Shaykh, you know, coming out in the heat, concentrating and, you know, thinking about what he has to say and stuff. And all, the, all of these things, and if I didn't mention before, but the Sheikh obviously was diabetic. So, you know, all of these things. But I remember there was a visit from a brother from Mecca who was very close to the Sheikh, who used to read them to the Sheikh. When he saw that, you know, we weren't reading anything after obviously that time, he didn't come in the beginning when we were. He asked us, you know, why aren't you benefiting from the Sheikh? And we were like, you know, we were, but, you know, we were told we have to stop and everyone has to kind of stop. So these were kind of one of the political stuff that were, you know, I started to see. It was kind of an eye opener for me because it's like, of course, it's maybe, you know, we should think about the Sheikh's health, but I very well knew afterwards that the Sheikh had no problem with it whatsoever, you know, in terms of us reading on, because we, we wouldn't, especially me, myself and the brother and, you know, the brothers that are in the car, we weren't someone, we weren't those that would read and then ask and ask and, you know, we'll just read whatever the Sheikh can and then we'll be like, a, and it was just literally from the car back, that's it. So it wasn't even more than 50, I wouldn't say it's more than 20 minutes, probably less. Because sometimes there'll be traffic and then reading, we stop and then we come back in the car and then same thing, maybe the Sheikh will stay an extra couple of minutes before he leaves his car to go up. So it wasn't long, but it was very beneficial. So Qadrullah Ma Shafa'at, those lessons stopped. And then the lessons moved to Sahih Muslim in Mashir Ridwan. And that's when I remember uh, um, Mashir Ridwan, everyone that was there at the time, they knew how packed those lessons would get, MashaAllah. And that's literally, that, that was in the first year anyway, the Sheikh moving when he mentioned how old he was, that he was 86 years old. After him, the, I remember Sheikh Abdullah Bukhari must have mentioned something to him, because he was the reader for the Sheikh, by the way. And he mentioned something to him in terms of the Sheikh, he made a mistake on something. And the Sheikh said, you know, you know, forgive me, but you know, I've passed the age, I'm 86 years old. I'm not as young as all of you. MashaAllah. And the Sheikh, it was nice, it was really, really nice. You know, Mashir Ridwan would meet all the brothers, the, brother would come, the brothers that would come there, and they would, um, you know, benefit from the Sheikh. And that was like a big highlight for the week, you know, coming Sahih Muslim. But Qadrullah Mashafal, again, once again, they didn't last too long. The Sheikh's health deteriorated, he got a bit more ill. So they had to come to a stop. So coming back to um, um, the, uh, um, the Fajr, so before we even get on to the, going to the Haram, it was, it was really, really nice. And we got to learn eventually that the Sheikh, he obviously is his diabetes, you know, he's, I think, I forgot what types it is, but I think type two is the worst. I'm not, mis if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but he had the really serious one. So he, he used to have insulin and what have you and take it. So when now the Sheikh would come for Salatul Fajr, I remember one time he came and then he was on me and then we put him down See, he, he used to pray, by the way, most of the times, sit, um, standing up, and then we'll get the chair for him to sit down, waiting for the salah. And if he needs to sit down, he'll sit down. But that's one thing as well, I realized the Sheikh, he would always, you know, uh, fight his, his, you know, his, he would always fight himself to always push, he'd always push himself along, Barak. Anyway, so um, at one point, I remember the brother, he, uh, um, the Sheikh, he was going to get up, but then he was a bit fainty. The brother helped him up. And I was on the Sheikh's right, so the brother helped him up from his left. And then the Sheikh asked for some sort of sweet, anything that's sweet. And I think the brother must have had a sweet in his pocket and he gave it to him. 
So Jazallah Khair, that brother, may Allah reward him, from then onwards, he would always come with honey. And there were many incidents when the Shaykh, he would get up or his, you know, he needs his sugar levels to go higher or, um, you know, he needs to take something sweet, I should say. The brother would give him honey, he would have a spoon, he would have honey, like literally just right there in the masjid. So when he wasn't able to come, he would always give it to me, say, Abdullah, make sure you take it, don't forget it. So that brother, Jazallah Khair, he would always make sure that, you know, we're very ready for the Shaykh. And literally, like I said, the honey would help because many times we were there, the honey was there, you know, we would help him and give it to him. So when his sons saw this, they also became really, you know, uh, grateful, the fact that, you know, we're there. And it also gave them that kind of comfortability, you know, that, you know what, they're just there to help. You know, inshallah, there's going to be no sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, any sort of problems that's going to occur from us. So then at that stage, we were told as well, I remember, because I was the closest there and the brother obviously had work in the evenings, the stage was re the stage reached where the Sheikh would get visitors after Isha. So I'm still now not really attending the Haram, it still, not, it still hasn't come into, you know, into play. But if the Sheikh needed something, I remember the beginning, they came and they did the bookshop, whatever, they set it up, the brothers came and did the books. That took a long time as well because his books came in intervals and mashallah the maktab was, his, you know, his maktab was really nice. You know, the little kind of uh, room that he had, kind of like office room, you'd say maktab or maktaba, you know, library office slash. That was nice, it was downstairs basically basement. So the sheikh obviously he had um, a lift that he needed to use himself because you know, it was a big house in Lombardic. It was him and his other family members living there. And obviously the, the, the room was downstairs, so you can either go take the stairs or you can go in and take the lift. Obviously family and people that knew the sheikh would take the lift and everyone else would go downstairs. So I remember I was called at one time as well to help set up, I think it was like one of the gatherings that were going to happen for, uh, um, um, what was it? Yeah, the gathering was going, that was going to happen for um, people that were going to start to attend, you know, just setting up, you know, putting the microphone, um, you know, there's putting pay, you know, there's like, please don't touch kind of thing with the books, um, you know, the papers that are like, meaning don't take them away, you know, you can read them, benefit, you can see. But so the Sheikh kind of, it was, you know, it was proper arranged. We had to do the lighting. We had to put tape on the you know, wires and stuff, put them to the side. So it wasn't dangerous. It wasn't hazardous. And I remember the first, or I should say, so hey, Muslim as well, when that was still there as well, that became packed. So then afterwards, later on, that was, it, it was really, and I remember, I forgot to mention, the Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad bin Rabi, his son used to be the one that would, when, when they were reading on him, Sahih so Muslim, when he was in his basement, like library, he would always be there as well. And I love that Sheikh, subhanAllah, Sheikh, his son, his oldest son, so he's Abu Muhammad, obviously, who's also a, a scholar and a teacher, he um, used to always be the one that would ask questions and kind of, you know, um, you know, have a discussion with his father with regards to what he's saying. So that was really beneficial as well. Um, may Allah preserve all our scholars And then obviously the, the, um, I remember when we set it up The people that attended were great in number So if the sheikh would have a big turnout Or if, we, if it was known that it was going to be a big turnout It would be in the basement If it was just like for example A little group of 10 people or 6 people Then it would be upstairs in his room that he has It's like a, like a library upstairs Where he rests and stays Obviously downstairs he, it's difficult for him to go there Every single day commute up and down He's old, so he would be upstairs, he's got books there as well. Then when I first entered, I remember I actually first entered that room upstairs before I became close to the sheikh, an incident when I was just there in the room downstairs in the basement and then um, a brother went up to see the sheikh and I kind of got the you know signal from the driver that I can, you know. So we, we went up anyway, that was the first time seeing the sheikh in that kind of position on his bed. So then later on when I went and started kind of arranging things, if the Sheikh, I remember how it would work, I would get the phone calls that, you know, Abdullah, listen, so-and-so is coming. When they come, tell him to wait, go up, check this, check that, arrange it with the Sheikh, see if he's ready, and then come. So then that started happening, and I would always make sure that when I go in the car, I make sure, I, you know, I either sometimes I'll go with him or I'll tell the driver to go with him. If the driver needs help with something, then I'll go up with him, the Sheikh as well. You know, but I would always make sure I'm respectful. I'll give salam to make sure there's no, um, none of the sheikh's uh, woman folk in the, uh, you know, around. And then afterwards, I'll come back down. I'll call the brothers, say to them, look, Ikhwani, no recording is allowed. You can't record. 
you know, make sure you, you know, make keep it short and snappy, the Sheikh's not well. And then they would follow me up, we'll go up. When the Sheikh was, was there, um, whenever they would be there, me, I never used to get involved, you know, I let them give the Sheikh what they need in terms of questions. They ask a benefit. The ones that I benefited the most were the ones that were not coming with questions of fitting. Because unfortunately, and may Allah, you know, preserve the Sheikh and, you know, uh, protect him from all evil and all harm. But the Sheikh, he, when I sometimes used to look at him, you know, as I'm there, either sitting up or standing down, depending, I'd be like, subhanAllah, that's a great responsibility. Like, you know, the Sheikh gets asked questions that they are basically seeking a verdict so they can go and either give it or use it in the way they wish, not knowing, obviously, the Sheikh not knowing how they're going to do that. But his intention is just to, you know, advise them in goodness. So that kind of, for me, became really like, subhanAllah, this, this is, you know, a big responsibility. So the ones that I, you can kind of tell, not, not no need for me to mention where they were from and what have you, but just generally speaking, those that knew who would come, like I became fully aware of them after, you know, the first couple of sittings. I'm like, okay, yep, it's that jama'ah, they're going to come and yeah, I know what's, what's going to happen next. <laughs> and obviously... Those that would come and be like, I remember one group, I remember, mashallah, um, actually that was downstairs and it was a group of brothers and they came and one of them said, Shaykhana, yani kul ha'ula hafad, Shaykhana, all of these are, you know, those that have memorized the book of Allah, Izza wa Jal, and memorized it and, you know, the, the, their reward is basically us bringing them for Umrah. So one of, is it possible if one of them, one or two of them can recite? So they recited, I remember, verse from the Quran and the Sheikh gave like a little, you know, a little, little um, explanation, tafsir, annotation, um, you know, just a little kind of brief explanation and, and advise them to carry on, to seek knowledge, you know, to be people of knowledge, to try and benefit, to apply for the universities, to study. And then, mashallah, the, then they would leave. Those were like the sweet, beautiful ones because they're just coming just to kind of show the sh those that are like the Murshideen, the guide, you know, the, the tour guides are coming to bring the youth to see who the ulama are, you know. So it's like a good wake up reminder, you know, something to take back home. Um, whenever, if either upstairs or downstairs, even upstairs, I remember the Shaykh would always be like, Ya Abdullah, tayyibhum, tayyibhum. Or Abdullah, you know, pure, of, you know, give them, you know, um, um, give them nice sense, you know, make, make sure you give them, um, you, no, it's not purify in a way, but I can say, um, you know, make sure you give them some sort of nice scent to go away with. So the Sheikh had like very nice expensive oud and you know, I'll give it to each and every one of them. And this was something the Sheikh would always tell me. And then let's say for example, they are there, they've arrived, the Sheikh would be like, Yalla Abdullah Subul Qahwa al Shai, the Shabab, you know, like Yalla Abdullah, you know, give them tea and coffee. And this was for me like was something that I enjoyed because obviously, you know, I'm aiding the Sheikh. And making them feel comfortable. The Sheikh wants to be very hospitable, and he was very much so. And you know, this was something that was amazing because it's, it, it really showed me that the advice the Sheikh would give, uh, you know, was fear Allah. You know, he would always ask them, "How's da'wah in your city or in your country where you reside? You know, how are the how is the jama'at? You know, the different congregations are you guys? You know, unified. Make sure you be unified. You know, you know, taqullah." You know, bil ukhuwa wal mahabba wal rahma. And the Shaykh would all be like, I advise you with, you know, calmness. I advise you with, uh, you know, mercy. I advise you with, you know, being with one another. And then the Shaykh would, most of the time, I'd say most of the time, he would recite the verse, wa ati'u Allah wa rasulahu wa la tanaza'u fa tafshalu wa tadhaba rihakum. You know, wasbiru inna Allah ma'a sabr. This verse, the Shaykh would always recite it. And literally, let's say most, most of the times, most of the times the Shaykh would recite this verse and, uh, you know, when the Shaykh would recite this verse, which obviously means, you know, uh, and obey and uh, worship Allah, obey Allah the Almighty and His Messenger and do not differ and do not argue and differ. You know, that which Allah would what? That meaning you'll be left to uh, this is like a, it was like a general advice the sheikh would give and obey Allah and his messenger and do not dispute with one another don't lo, don't differ and dispute and you know always argue lest you lose courage and your strength will depart your strength will what would depart and be patient surely Allah is uh, is with those who are sabirun the patient ones so the sheikh would recite this verse and repeat it in all the gatherings i, I recall the sheikh had to at least quote that verse once 
So it, it was for me, it was like the Sheikh just wants them to be as an Ummah, you know, united and unified and, you know, strong and to have mercy. And the Sheikh would be like as well, don't, let, don't enter the affairs of fitna. Don't enter the affairs of fitna and don't entertain these affairs and stuff like that. And that was amazing because for me, I walked away every single time that happened. This was just the beginning. So maybe let's say five, six of them in the beginning was just something that's all new to me. And I remember I would go back and I will tell, tell my wife about it, you know, as a, as a point of benefit. Now, this was when it got a bit difficult because there'll be times when I would have to stay from obviously, let's say the sheikhs prayed to Isha and come back, whatever. And I've been there. I'm local. I'm called, you know, can you come? Okay, I stayed with the Sheikh from Isha time, depending on it was maybe half an hour with them rain coming up and down, whatever, da da da. Stay in with the Sheikh, asking Q and A, and then the, them leaving, and the Sheikh sometimes would call me, and they'd be like, "Hey, Abdullah, يعني تعال ساعدني خذ لي هذا الكتاب, give me this book, give me that book. Can you go into Sahab You know that that famous website that was there. So obviously for my family, it became a bit, you know, sometimes time to eat. I'm, you know, having to wait on me and this this that. So may Allah reward her you know, for her patience, because it was difficult, you know, it was difficult. And this is now, I haven't even got into Ramadan, I haven't even got into Haram when responsibilities just basically went flying out the window. They just literally came flying out the window directly to me because it's like responsibility after responsibility after responsibility, phone call after phone call after phone call, because bearing in mind, I'm the first line of contact with the gospel was happening. And like I said, it wasn't the same setup as Mecca, you know, tabs were being kept on people, certain people that are coming, going in and out. Why are they there for? What's, what's happening? What did they ask? What they didn't ask? Did they record? Did they not record? Who were they? <sighs> you know, it was difficult, like I said, but I think we'll stop on that note, inshallah, and we'll carry on in the next video because then it's going to be something else and more things were going to, uh, more things were uh, started to occur as I got closer to the sheikh. And the Sheikh let my character and who I was and how I carried myself and then obviously leading on to the Haram, leading on to Salat al Jumu'ah, then Ramadan and other things. May Allah Azza wa accept it from us all. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Once again, just as you know, a point of benefit and to highlight, highlight this, these videos are not anything except just to bring about you know, some sort of, you know, attention or highlight benefits of the scholars and how they are as people and individuals and to show a different, you know, looking at it from a different lens of how the scholars are and how they treat others and not that which you, you have been subjected to. And I say you, all those listening, all those who even think and may believe they know the scholars, but really and truly they don't because they've just gone to a sitting or two, a Umrah trip, Hajj trip, three months, a year, two yeah, and they don't really know and, you know, they believe the scholars are a certain way and then they quote them and they completely are different towards us, towards how the actual scholar is and how the scholar teaches. And may Allah accept it, make us sincere. Wa akhir da'wan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.